two women willing to take the lead. A jug of milk, a hammer, a tent peg, and a defeated foe. A song of gratefulness to God. Gideon is enlisted in the Lord's service. And the bread of life miraculously feeds 5,000. Today on 3 in 1, as we consider Judges chapters 4 through 6 and John chapter 6. Well, as we began our reading today, we were introduced to a woman named Deborah, a prophetess who was judging Israel at the time after 20 years of harsh oppression from Jabin, the king of Canaan. Sensing it was time for salvation, Deborah sends for a man named Barak. She sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh and Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops on Mount Tabor, Take with you ten thousand men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. (laughs) So she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. See, Deborah understood that the Lord could use anyone at any time with whatever they had available to accomplish his will. Unfortunately, Barak did not see that. So over and over and over again, we see Deborah exhorting this guy to be a man and trust the Lord. In verse 14, Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. See, once Barak finally got up and began to trust the Lord, Scripture says, The Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. Again, this is such a great illustration of the fight of faith. Here you have this reluctant man, timid, fearful. A woman is exhorting him to stand up and trust God, but he hesitates. But once he finally stands to fight, the Lord routs all of his enemies with the edge of his own sword. And Barak ends up being listed in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews. Now, if you noticed, there was one who fled away on foot, Sisera, the commander of the armies of Jabin, king of Canaan. But God knows right where he is. And remember, God can use anyone, anywhere, at any time with whatever they have available to them, with, with, with whatever they have in their hands, <laughs> even if it happens to be a jug of milk, a hammer, and a tent peg. Ha! <laughs> Really, if you didn't read today, you are missing out. What an amazing account. What courage J.L. had. Don't worry, Barak. God's got it covered. Verse 22 said, And then as Barak pursued Sisera, J.L. came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera, dead with the tent peg in his temple. And so, once again, God can use anyone, anywhere, at any time, with whatever they have available to them, with whatever they have in their hands at the time, to accomplish His will. So, ultimately, it is the Lord who is fighting the fight through whoever is willing, whoever is willing to stand up and fight by faith. Verse 23, So on that day God subdued Jabin king of Canaan in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. See, we think it would be easier to sit down and rest, to settle for sin, to lay down and be lazy. But the opposite is true. When we choose to fight by faith, to be aggressive in rooting sin out of our lives, we become stronger and stronger. We go from strength to strength. And in chapter 5 of the book of Judges, we read of Deborah's song about this very thing, saying, or rather singing, when leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Well, after the death of Deborah, it didn't take Israel long to repeat the same process of 
disobedience, discipline, despair, and then desperation. And once again, God graciously chose to deliver them with a most unlikely candidate, a man named Gideon, who probably more than all of the other judges illustrates the truth that God can use anyone, anywhere, at any time with whatever they have in their hands, with whatever they have available to them at that time to accomplish his will. In verse 11 of chapter 6, it says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abbey's right, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> Once again, we have comedy in the scriptures. See, Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press, trying to hide. And the angel of the Lord is just sitting there watching him, seeing what he is going to be by faith. And he says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now he's not quite there yet. And Gideon responds with a bit of hesitation to this invitation to deliver Israel from the very people he's hiding from in a wine press. And so he says to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Once again, what a great way of summarizing the fight of faith. Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. See, Gideon wants to believe the Lord, and so he continues the conversation, but he asks for confirmation of the confirmation of the confirmation of the call on his life. As we read at the end of chapter 6, God graciously gives this mighty man of valor the confirmation that he was asking for, and the confirmation of that confirmation, and so on and so on and so on. Why? Because God really cares about this man, and this man is really called to lead God's people. And so, as we get to chapter 7, it's time to fight by faith. And as we know, the fight of faith looks very different than fighting in our own strength. And that is going to be the most amazing story in tomorrow's reading. And we'll have to talk about that tomorrow. Okay, on to our New Testament reading for today, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, where we read of the bread of life feeding 5,000 when the people of God gave to Jesus whatever they had in their hands at the time. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9 says, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. The writer of the proverb is asking God not to give him too little or too much, but only just enough. And reading that, we think, <laughs> that'd be nice. But experience tells us that all too often, God gives us too little or too much, and not just in a financial sense. I mean, sometimes it's too little resources, or sometimes it's too much trouble. Like we read today, we, we saw at the beginning, too little resources standing before the 5,000. And then we saw at the end, what looked like too much trouble sailing on the Sea of Galilee in a storm. It's a quandary, isn't it? Why Jesus would constantly place us in this place of perplexity and why he would do that on purpose. Pastor David Gusick said, We will face trials when we set out to do what Jesus tells us to do. Jesus knows this. He understands it. We should never be deceived into thinking that if we were really right with God, everything in life would be easy. See, Jesus in his sovereign grace will often give us too little or too much so that we will realize that he is more than enough for every circumstance or every need that may arise in our lives. Can't you just see the smile come across the face of Jesus when he leans over and asks Philip in the face of the oncoming crowd, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, he knew exactly what he was about to do. He was just discipling his disciples, testing them, teaching them to walk by faith. Hey, Philip, this is your hometown, right? 
What are we going to do? <laughs> Where are we going to get all the bread that we need to feed all of these people? Has Jesus ever done this to you? You're staring at some need, some overwhelming need. And he comes and he stands next to you and he looks at it with you and he says, Whoa, what are you going to do? <laughs> and you respond, I have no idea. It looks impossible. I don't have anywhere near enough resources to meet that need. And so Philip says to him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may even have a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Consider the contrast here between Philip and Andrew. Philip is the informed and educated one. This is his hometown. He has all the facts. Half a year's wages wouldn't even be enough to buy them a snack. And then ignorant Andrew walks up with all that they have, and he gives it to Jesus. Five biscuits and a, a couple of sardines from a kid's lunchbox. And you can almost hear his excitement fade as he realizes how ridiculously limited the resources are compared to the need they were trying to fulfill. But then they actually gave Jesus whatever they had in their hand at that time. And the good shepherd made the sheep sit down in green pastures as he blessed, broke, and miraculously multiplied their ridiculously limited resources in order to feed the masses. And Jesus, he does this all the time. He really does. He does this all the time in all sorts of ways as we are overwhelmed seeing the need, seeing our ridiculously limited resources. And then in faith, we bring all that we have, whatever we have in our hands at the time, and we give it to Jesus who blesses it and breaks it and miraculously multiplies it to feed the masses. He does that with me every Sunday. He does that with me every morning. Jesus, all I have is my life and my lungs. All I have are my mornings and a microphone, but I offer it all to you because I see this great need. I see this great need for your people to know you. So as I offer my ridiculously limited resources to him, he blesses, he breaks, and he miraculously multiplies time and time and time again to feed the masses as he makes them sit down in groups to feed upon God's word. And you know what? I get fed and miraculously, abundantly blessed in the process. Did you notice that? Afterwards, they picked up enough fragments that it filled 12 baskets full, one for each of them, as they stood amazed at what Jesus is able to do when we trust him with whatever we have in our hands at the time. The bread of life, miraculously feeding the masses through willing servants who are learning that he is able if we simply lean into the difficulty by faith and trust him. Lean into it with me, would you? Do you see the masses? Do you see how hungry they really are for God and for God's word? Do you see how ridiculously limited our resources are? Well, with the eyes of faith, we are learning to say as we lean in together, what an excellent opportunity for God to do a miraculous work as we offer to him whatever we have in our hands at the time, as he blesses, as he breaks, and as he miraculously multiplies, as he fulfills the great need, and as he feeds us in the process. <laughs>